Hello. Yeah, my name's Graham Dorn. I'm going to talk today about some of my, ex well, introduce and, and then try and feed in some of my experiences into the world of progressive web applications. So yeah, what is a progressive web application or a PWA? Its, its main goal is to have a browser-based application that can have parity or have the same set of features as you would get from a native application. And as I said, I've, I've had the joy of delivering a few of these into production and working with these. And I wanted to sort of introduce them and try and look at where they actually are now. Because when we talk about PWAs, that they're not necessarily a new concept, that they've been around for, I think, five or six years now. But when they were concepted, that they were brought into use, and it was built around these nine sort of pillars that at the time, they said it's like a web application. I believe they said that a web application has taken all the right vitamins. And these nine things that they have here are the vitamins that your web application will take to make it a progressive web application. But when you actually look at these and break it down from like our sort of more modern, modern approach and modern perspective, you really get these sort of three groups of these pillars that you have. The first one, I think, is very obvious. And now in 2021, this is what we are doing anyway when we're building web applications is to sort of have an app mindset first. So you're thinking about how users are interacting with it. You're making sure it works across different device sizes. You have your transitions and your animations and sort of this really like app-like feel to what you're developing. The next sort of set of four that we had, again, they sound quite exotic and interesting, but they're really just our modern web practices that we have now. So you talk about things like it being fresh, and that just means that you can continuously deliver updates to users, which are what, when we're deploying websites or web applications, that's what's happening when our users are accessing them. And things like safer to just make sure that you have correct uh, transport layer security in place or and these other types of things. The other two parts to that as well, that you have the discoverable and linkable. And I think this is just to anchor the fact that a PWA is something that is running in a browser and built on top of the web-based technologies that we have. So discoverable is that you can make sure that everything can be accessed accessed through a browser and also linkable is that you're using the routing and your sort of usual like uh, url routing that you can access the application through urls it's not something that's running separately say like a native application but that takes us to like the final three and this is more what i will try and talk about or focus on more as we're going through which you have the the sort of connectivity independence so that's really the if you have a PWA, it can work when you have no internet connection. It can work offline to some extent, depending depending on the specific situations of what your app is doing. You have things like re-engageable, which is that it can have uh, push notifications to users and it can be installable. So a user can like install it and it will appear as it is a native app, but is actually running inside a browser and it is a browser-based application. The interesting part for re-engageable or push notifications as well is is how important they are to make it a progressive web application that is it something that it's not a pwa unless it has push notifications it's debatable whether it needs to be there or not and i think probably at the time the idea of this as well was more that you're thinking about it less like a passive and static website page is more like an application that can interact with the user but that's like nine things that sound very good and there are a lot of them but then when you actually look at what what makes a PWA technically, which is probably what we are more interested in here, that there's three main aspects to it. And these are what you need to transition from having a web app to a progressive web app. The first one is that you need to serve all content via HTTPS, which I think where we are now is a no brainer and should be done by default by us all anyway. The next part is what you need, what is known as a web app manifest. And this is really just a simple file that informs the browser that it's dealing with a progressive web application and what its name is and other bits like icons and so on. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. And then the third part, which is the most complex and probably the biggest part of this is that the site needs to use a service worker and say, this is something that's running in the, separately to your main web application, but you can really look at this, that this is running like providing the offline support and providing these sort of background functionalities that bring a more app-like sort of functionality into your web app. So I said web app manifest is quite simple. And really this is just a JSON file that you drop at the root of your website and informs the browser that it's looking at something that can be a progressive web application. It contains various bits and pieces. There's not much more than this than you need. You have sort of the name, just like the name that you're giving to your application. So when it's installed, it has a name and you have other bits like the icons that are used. And if you have any 
any other bits of the browser, sort of what color it should be. Should it have a separate color to the browser defaults? And also where your app is running into the context of the root. Really, these are quite trivial to add that you just get to one of these files and drop it so it's served at the root of your directory, and then you have this in place. What is more complex is what is known as a service worker. And this is something that is run completely separately to your web app inside as part of a separate thread. And it will interact with your web application and sort of have certain background activities there. They also run a service worker is running independently of your browser. Say if you have multiple tabs of the same app, the service worker is, you only still have a single service worker and it's interacting with all those tabs. So you just have one service worker per application, even if you have multiple tabs open rendering that application. And for this reason as well, that the service worker is running separately, it has its own sort of sets of like available APIs and how it works and also can't directly interact with the DOM or the application running inside the browser tab that they have a messaging system in place so you can have these interactions. One of the main parts, as we said as well, is that they're used to provide offline support. So the service worker has the ability to intercept all your network requests from your web application and decide how to handle them. But is it serving from a cache or then is it going to directly use the network or something in between depending on your network connectivity? The other part with a service worker as well is that they have a sort of a slightly different life cycle to how you view your web app inside a browser tab. And that's because they because they are running separately to the browser tab and also can serve multiple browser tabs that they, they have this life cycle. So if you have no previous service worker, that they have a certain state where they will be installed for the first time, and then they become active and start talking and sharing information or intercepting network requests from your web application. The second part is if you're updating the service worker, that you will obviously you will you will have that new version served and then it will be installed, but it won't actually be active. It will be in a waiting state until the previous version of your service worker has no no client tabs uh, interacting with and then then your new version of your service worker will move into the active state and become the service worker that's having these interactions with, with your instances of your web application. This is one of these places which I'll try and highlight, but usually where you start to get headaches is where you're not using the service worker that you think you are, or it's in some odd state. And this is, this is part of this where once you start working with PWAs and get some of this experience, you start to see where these pitfalls can be and start to try and figure out how to get around them. So with that first part in place, what I wanted to look at as well is how we do some of these things and how it actually looks in practice or what we're doing. So the for the first part, which you've probably seen, is the installation of progressive web apps. And this one I didn't have a live demo for because I wasn't going to start trying to share my mobile screen as well and have it seen through this. So I've just got three nice screenshots here. But you've probably seen these types of pop-ups if you visited websites that have these MPWA requirements in place. And it gives you the ability inside a browser to install this application. And when you click install, you get your icon and the name of your application. And then you can have it running in something that looks like and appears like a native application. So for, for the user, it will appear like it is this native application, but it is just running inside a minimal browser and it's been installed. But on for the more, what I'll try and do and show in introduced like actually with the service workers and doing the offline support is having this offline and caching and how that can actually be implemented in, in the background for applications and to enable this like offline capability for the web applications. And um, with like caching, the sort of, I'll focus on these three main strategies and there are more, but these, these I feel the most common or the ones that I have used. And you have things like if you have these strategies, which is how you're planning on caching your network requests or what you should be doing with them. So say if you have a cache first type strategy, that means that any network request from your web application will first be checked if it has a value in the cache. And if it does, it will use that. And if not, it falls back to the network. So it then makes the actual request across the internet to where it needs to be and then cache the result. You have the inverse of that, which is network first, which is that first you will always try to get a value from the network. And if the network isn't available, like as in device offline, then it can use a cached value. And then the final one is just a fully online, online approach where you will only ever use the network and not use any caching in place. So if I seamlessly move across to, to the web application that I very, I very quickly made a basic PWA using Create React app that has a lot of nice boilerplate pieces. And this is what we're looking at here. So the first part, which I won't dwell on, is just the web app manifest and Again, it is a JSON file with some properties, the important ones being like the name and the icons and then how the app should be rendered if it's installed. The other part to look at 
as well, which this is this looks like a lot, and there's a lot of comments here. This is mostly boilerplate from the Create React app, but there's a certain process and what you should do when you're installing a service worker. And this, this JavaScript file here, that your TypeScript file that you're looking at, is executed when your website is loaded, and it will register that service worker with the browser and inform the browser what website it's working with and how it should be interacted with. I won't bother to... Could you zoom in a little bit? Yeah, sure. We're suffering with the 720p on Google Hangouts. So. <laughs> Here we have the service worker registration. As I said, a lot of this is boilerplate. And the, the key part of it is that you access the service worker API inside your browser and just register the JavaScript file that you want to be running as your service worker. If we look at a service worker as well, and this is worth mentioning that because service workers are interacting with your network traffic, how your browser is caching, the website code and how your application is actually sort of rendering or not rendering or get fetching the data that it needs to render render its views that there's a lot of room to shoot yourself in the foot and you get a lot of headaches if you are <laughs> with misconfiguration inside service workers but there is a library that you have or libraries from google called workbox which simplify and make this process a lot easier of implementing the various bits and pieces that you need to have inside your service workers. What you're looking at here then is the service worker itself. And again, the first part of this is just the boilerplate that you can get from if you're using Create React app or say some of the other um, templates that you have, but it does various things such as caching your application like images so that if, if the network is unavailable, that it will just make sure that you're using cached the images from a cache and you're not requiring to fetch them from the network. What I will focus on at the bottom, which is the part and sort of the beef of the demo that we will have, is this part at the bottom. And this is where this is where here I'm implementing a cache to the web application that I will show you in a second. And around that, it's having different cache strategies for different network URLs. So one, one nice thing is that you can decide based on the URL or other rules what type of caching you want in place or how you want the network requests to be handled. What I have set up is a simple like API, backend API that has three endpoints and each of them just respond with the current UTC time, but they have separate, separate paths to reach those so that I can implement a different strategy for each. So we have three different endpoints for the cache time. We have a cache first strategy. For the no cache, we are only using the network. And then for the network first, we have a network first strategy, which I'll demonstrate as we see in a minute. But this is where this service worker is listening to the browser traffic. It's intercepting these requests and evaluating what to do with those network requests, how it should handle them. If we then look at here, so on the left-hand side is a very awesome app that took me about two hours to make. And here we have buttons that will just send a fetch request for the various URLs that I talked about and add the time and display the time inside the uh, system. So if we send a fetch request for each of these endpoints, you get the current time from the system. You'll see with the cache, the sort of the cache first strategy that it will now, the time will never change because it's only ever using that cached value that you have, which you can see inside here, it will never change. Obviously, if we delete the cache and fetch it again, it updates, but then it's never gonna be changed inside the cache. You have then have the network only rule that will always update from your API. And then also the network first will ignore the cache and always update from the API, but you'll see it update the cache as well as it goes. And um, if we then like turn off the network, that you'll see then that the fetch requests using the service worker that the cache is working fine as it was before, if you're going directly to the network, your requests are failing. And then with this network first sort of caching, you can see that the cached value is used. It's obviously not current, but it's the cached value. If we turn, if we then turn everything back online, then the, the network is reused and the cache is ignored. Chrome has very, I, I think, very good dev tools for trying to figure out this inside what's happening and looking at what you have cached and looking at what version of your service worker is running and so on. And also to try and it, the lighthouse auditing tools are very PWA focused in Chrome. So they're very good at trying, seeing what you're missing or if something's not correct with your application. But that was a very quick demo of just showing service workers and the caching. There are far more things they can do and there are a lot of uh, missteps you can have, but that's the main part of those. If we then skip back to the presentation, what I wanted to summarize is that these things all look amazing and great. And when I've 
either had to do these apps for like a production case or approach them that I've usually read about them and they sound fabulous and I've not really appreciated some of the caveats that you have with them. So if we think about it, like looking at what we have, like why do you want one? Why are they good? Why are they better than say, just a, just like a pure web app or say a native application? But what I think their main strength is that you have this consistent experience for like all your channels that you can have users using them like a native application or in a browser or on a desktop, but the they're using the same application and the experience and everything is the same. And being being like based via a web application that if you implement the caching and everything correctly, that it is, becomes easy just to deliver these updates for your users that you're not worrying about users having to say update through app stores. I think, and a, yeah, just a final note on that as well, that PWs are very good that they, because they automatically prompt for install or you can trigger that, that it makes it very easy for users to install that to their device and then use that application. But you're not having to direct them to an app store and have that barrier to entry to installing them. And depending on what your use case is, that can be a higher barrier to entry, say if you're going to like a coffee shop that they want you to install their app that you've then got to figure out where to put or look after, or if you're just say at another good case is like an event where you, you have an application that you want to use for a very short period of time. So it's nice if it's just a web-based application that you can store on your phone and have it that native like experience but then when you're finished with it it's easy enough to get rid of or ignore i think the other part as well is why don't you want them and the biggest like the issues i've encountered is that you're at the mercy of how browsers and the different browsers have implemented various web apis which is like with anything but you have to be careful at what you're trying to do what, what progressive features you're trying to add and how you're trying to have it operate like an application and what the browsers will actually support and that kind of leads into that if you really want these complex interactions, if you're trying to use like device location sensors or how you're using them, that there are various nuances and limitations with that. And I added there that maybe people want to build a native app as well. And this is then from like our perspective that I tried to think about, like, why would we want to make one? And again, as a disclaimer, I'm not a native app developer. I have dabbled occasionally and it's always been a very big learning curve to actually set up and get started and the real benefit i see with these is that you can very easily just use these modern tools that we have to generate what is effectively an application that users can use and you can have it be delivered and installable within i don't know 30 minutes or an hour like the example we saw took me probably two hours to set up with styling and things and then it's available as a native application to all users and i think as well what i what i have found with them and what's maybe not always mentioned is that your analytics or like your your sort of telemetry for the app is is based on the same application that every user is using so they're using the same version they're, sorry they're using the same application it has the same workflow it has the same like screens or views and pieces of the ui and you can then collect them in the same tool because i have had cases where there's two different like there's a Android version of the application and then a web-based application. And you have to use these analytics collection systems that are different and try and merge that data and to really get an overview of how your users are interacting with the application. Um, but then like just very quickly in summary, like where are they now and what's happening? Because as I said, this is something that's been around for is it six years now, five or six years that really with, with like the attitude of how this should work is you have these two camps. And the first one is Google, Microsoft, Samsung are the prominent ones and some others. And what these are aiming for, they are thinking that PWAs are something that should be evolved further are the future. And they're aiming that they have this parity with native applications. That's sort of their driver, and that's why a lot of the resources you will see, as I've put as references inside this, are all like Google-based resources, and they have the libraries to sort of implement these features and implement service workers and so on, and Chrome has the tooling to actually build them. The other camp that you have are Apple and sort of Mozilla and more recently, and they sort of have the guise of saying it's for a more private web, it's adding less capabilities. I think you can have functionality with privacy and security as well. It just maybe requires more work in doing this, but they're sort of they're they're not really interested in not driving like this these more progressive type web application use cases. You could also look at Apple as well that they have a very big app store ecosystem, where, which is tightly controlled. So you have parts outside that. And that's where when you're using these, you see Chrome is very good for having it as the running device, and then things like Safari have a lot of limitations for how you can actually build them. As I kind of tried to touch on going through this, like the takeaway from this then is that 
we do a lot of things now that are almost there with PWAs and the parts that we that sort of you can uh, that maybe the the newer bits or the the more the more detailed bits are say things like the service workers that just require some care but if you have a need where you're doing like either prototyping because you have that velocity of getting your app created or you have an application that's using purely like web API interactions to render data then they are PWAs are very good and quick to develop and provide that like needed needed functionality for users but as I said like with the complex cases that it, they're not something that will solve everything usually when they're introduced it's like PWAs are web applications that behave like native applications but really there are like some of these more detailed interactions or this like consistency between browsers that you can have issues if you want to do things like say real-time gps tracking is one is one issue that i've hit my head up against and some other bits and pieces so that's where you should evaluate like carefully what's the actual need what are you trying to do and what do you want to do but that was kind of a very rapid tour and foray through pwas so thank you guys for listening hopefully some of that was new and interesting and if there are any questions just feel free to ask thanks a lot graham that was was really good really interesting we can take one quick question at this point and then yes please thanks for the presentation it was super interesting uh one quick question is do you have any examples of your favorite progressive web apps like which sites have done this really well properly I think there's things like I, my favorite one that comes to mind and that I was thinking of and one that I use is uh, Todoist that has that you can have it running basically like an application because it is just a it, it's a to-do list which is all all the basic sort of functionality that you need and I think that works really well what I felt and this is this is something that I really wanted to do and unf unfortunately COVID kind of impacted that last year was that it was like the event the event app that you could have your schedule and your favorites and your own timeline for an event type app. I think that fits like perfectly for this type of use case that you want people to look at it and install it, say for that evening. And you give them that full native experience, but you it's quick to develop and minimal entry to get them to install.